hundred yards uh, after Sant'Andrea al Quirinale, we've come to another uh, busy intersection in Rome. Um, and this is the church of San Carlo, St. Charles, uh, known as San Carlino, Little St. Charles, because it's a small church, Alle Quattro Fontane, the church of St. Charles at the Four Fountains, because we have at this intersection four fountains. Like Bernini's St. Andrew's Church, Sant'Andrea al Quirinale, this has a very limited space, and the great architect Borromini, Francesco Borromini, who was the exact contemporary of Bernini, great friend, colleague, and then rival, built this uh, basically for free. He was so grateful to this order of religion, the Trinitarians, uh, who were his first clients in Rome, that he said, I'll, I'll waive my fee. Of course, he allowed himself full creative freedom as well. Well, that's what you get when you work for free. When right? you work for free. Michelangelo also worked for yeah. free when he was consulted architect for St. Peter's, and right. uh, so he couldn't get sued either. So the, the ex exterior, what strikes me first is this, it's a wave. It's this undulating surface. Yeah, I think that's the key word for one of them anyway, for Borromini. Mathematics, perhaps before everything, pure, the pure science of mathematics. But then undulation, curving, and in particular, a balance between convex and concave. And this is a well-known feature of his architecture. And this is a very pure example of his work. Let's go inside. For Borromini, more than Bernini, the science of, of mathematics, and you have to read what Galileo wrote about this too, the idea of nature and geometry being inseparably uh, connected, uh, and just pure light and, and shapes comes to the fore. And what we have here is an oval shape, but it's a, 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 an undulating oval. But the basic concept doesn't really come from an oval, but from the main theme of the uh, order of religion that this church was owned by at that time, and that still owns it, the Trinitarians, that is, the followers of the Holy Trinity. Now, the Trinity is a triad, God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So if you think of it as a triangle, and make two triangles, draw them on a piece of paper, put them side by side, that is, one of the flat sides against one of the other flat sides, and you have a diamond shape or a lozenge shape. If you then inscribe around that, it becomes an oval. And if you inscribe within each triangle a circle, and then start to draw lines from one point to another, those are the lines of the architecture of this church. Um. And from the minute we walk in, we see one series of circles intersected by the beginning of a line, at what appears to be a right angle, then we realize it's not a right angle because it's a curve. We have a, a very sophisticated interconnection of geometrical shapes. But there's a unity here. Of course, all of this geometrical complexity resolves, and this is also very musical and mathematical. That is a complicated equation that ends up in resolving itself in a perfect number. And when the eye is drawn up by these great white columns, and again, a series of undulating lines that divide the lower part of the church from the, from the upper part, we go into a, a purer oval, and then above that, the pure white light of the real sunlight coming in through the lantern, and the ceiling is made of interconnected square shapes, crosses, hexagons, and octagons. And these are derived by Borromini from the early Christian church of Santa Costanza outside the walls of Rome, which was built in the fourth century and has exactly this series of interconnected geometrical shapes. And this is the early Christian fascination, we could say even the Byzantine one at that point, with interconnecting shapes that then resolve because they all fit together. This reminds me of Renaissance architecture and its appeal to the intellect, to sit and think and pay attention yes. visually. I think that apparent paradox of, you know, on the one hand imagination and fantasy and emotion, on the other intellect, actually do resolve mm -hmm. here because in the end it's this question of numbers that is, is so mysterious and yet it resolves in the end. Returning to music, we have to think of a great piece of music by Bach, let's say. Yeah. Now, the yeah. counterpoint, yeah. you do not yeah. have to be an expert in counterpoint to appreciate the music of Bach, to appreciate the extraordinary melodies and harmonies, and yet, of course, if you deconstruct, if you analyze it, we have something highly intellectual and, and mathematical, but we don't feel that we have to be at that level because the impact of that music is emotional, and this is where we get the crossing of those two worlds, mm -hmm. just as when we enter this church, we feel the impact of it immediately, visually, without having 
again, as I say, to, to, to involve ourselves too uh, intellectually. I love yes. The decorative elements here above the above the entrance. Above the entrance. Yes, sort and what of we see in and... these decorations is again symmetrical, but they all look different to begin with. But actually, it's one rosette that is a rose or flower-shaped uh, piece of architectural decoration, flanked by two others that are different, but they are symmetrical to each other, and two more. And the other thing that. Borromini was very fond of, and we find it throughout his architecture, is, well, first of all, carving. I should say he's, he's a stonecutter by, by trade, and his passion for detailed, painstaking stone cutting is visible in every single detail of these capitals and flowers, and in particular, the cherubs. Now, if we yes. look at any of his churches, we see very ornate cherubs. Now, these are from uh, the words in Judaism, cherubim and seraphim, those are the plural words, bodiless creatures who are closest to God. We might just call them angels, but they're something slightly different. They have a head and wings, but really no body. And he makes an endless variation on that theme with very broad wings spreading out. And the wings become like curly brackets that enclose another piece of architecture and sculpture. And fill those, those spaces, those complex spaces beautifully Yes. as well. When you were saying that, that carving is critical, it actually made me think of some of the ornate rosary beads that come out of the medieval period. The entire interior space almost feels as if it was carved out. Light unifies this entire space beautifully. As you were speaking of light, a shaft of sunlight came right down through the lantern. And it's brilliant, and it's brilliant. And this is the advantage, of course, having white architecture as we see it now. Mm -hmm.